The Divine Arsonist, A Tale of Awakening Written and read by the author, Jacob Norby Chapter 9 I drove in silence. The scenery passed outside like a movie on fast forward with the sound muted. Again, I felt strangely separated from my body. As an observer, I was in the back seat watching. The familiar physical sensations were distant, as if a remote receiver was transmitting them. In this state, I maneuvered. I could control my hands on the steering wheel, but didn't seem to be fully associated with them either. Like a ghost in the machine, I thought. This play of sensory dissonance was shattered by a siren behind me. I slammed back into physical awareness. My fingers tingled and my heart raced with adrenaline. I looked ahead. Somehow, I was rounding the sweeping curve of Highway 21 where it skirts Lucky Peak Dam. I couldn't remember making all the stops and turns to get there, but that wasn't important now. Red and blue lights flashed in the rear-view mirror, and I pulled over at the first turnout. Think, what did I do? I could remember nothing about the last ten minutes. On autopilot, I reached into the glove compartment for my registration and proof of insurance. The policeman was certainly taking his time. I rolled my driver's side window down and waited. The dashboard clock read 427. I hoped the officer would just give me a warning or write me a ticket or whatever he needed to do. Fast. I wasn't running late yet, but this was cutting it close. I began to regret my long lunch. Gravel crunched beside the car, and a pair of uniformed legs appeared at my open window. The patrolman bent down, but I couldn't see his face past the brim of his hat. State police. License and registration, sir, he said. I handed them to the window. He took them from me and stood there for a minute. I kept looking straight ahead. My mouth felt dry. Damn it, what did I do? Do you know why I pulled you over, sir? His voice contained a smile. He had overemphasized the sir. He was poking fun at me. I turned, and, and the tall officer squatted so I could see his face. He was shaking his head, grinning at my distress. Dave? I half yelled in surprise. It was my boyhood friend, David Simmons. I had attended his swearing-in as a state police officer a couple of years ago earlier in the rotunda of the Capitol building. He patrolled a 500-mile square of wilderness highway that included this stretch. I rarely saw him up here, but he sometimes stopped by our cabin. He'd write a note on the back of his business card and tuck it in the door frame. It was a small show of force in case the carpet thieves returned. We looked at each other. He reached in to shake my hand. Actually, I don't know what I did, I confessed. He made a show of peering in through my windows to look for contraband. You just seem like a suspicious character, he said. Actually, you drifted across the line a few times, but now that I've pulled you over, I see your suit is probably probable cause enough. You going to some kind of redneck mafia funeral or what? Yeah, how do I explain this, I thought. Oh, I said, I just left a wedding. I, I decided to get out of town right after and change clothes at the cabin. That was an easy lie. Huh, was all he said. Well, I'm going to need you to go easy on the speed until you get where you're going, okay? I'll let you off with a warning this time, but stay in your lane. In that moment, it didn't matter that he was my friend. Relief cascaded down my shoulders. My driving record was clear. Nice to keep it that way. We chuckled, and I thanked him. A blast of air rocked the car as a large Ford pickup blew around the curve. His brake lights lit up when the driver noticed the patrol car, but it was too late. David tapped the edge of my window. Duty calls. Be careful out there, man. I kept the car in park while he roared away in a spray of gravel. Dust from his exit swirled around the windshield, so I waited for it to clear before moving back onto the highway. 4.35. I wasn't tardy yet, but Lucius had asked me to return to the cabin no later than 5.30. He said he'd wait for me until then, but if I didn't show on time, he'd vanish forever. I was pushing things a little too close. Again. As often happens in southwest Idaho, the autumn weather had turned during the afternoon. Cold gray clouds had blown in across the Cascade Mountain Range from the coast of Washington. It wasn't raining, but that was probably next. In the higher elevations, we'd likely get snow before morning. I drove with the headlights on. Not quite dark yet, but the gloomy weather hastened twilight. We were in the midst of hunting season, and most of the deer were hiding far back in the mountains. Even so, I was watchful. The road narrowed to two lanes as I passed the cafe at the crest of the small summit known as Hilltop. 
It was the last place to get a cup of coffee between Boise and Idaho City. The parking lot was full of hunters' pickup trucks. The little restaurant was attached to a convenience store that specialized in cold beer, ice, bait, and fishing tackle. You could buy ammunition and disposable cameras there, but you'd pay the price for not picking them up before you left town. I crossed the high bridge over the almost empty reservoir. Every spring, melting snow rushed through the creeks, fed into the branches of larger streams, and filled this waterway. All summer, people navigated the narrow channel with small fishing boats, wakeboard boats, and jet skis. In late September, the pent-up river finally drained away under the dam and into the irrigation canals that watered the valley's lawns and farms. The highway snaked around the crumbling granite knees of the mountains where they knelt down to drink at the water's edge. My agile little car gripped the curves with ease. I could have driven faster, but as I drew close to my appointment with Lucius, somberness settled over me and required a deliberate pace. Perhaps it was an effect of the cloudy afternoon, but whatever the cause, my mood was tinged with foreboding. My mind fell into a cycle of reveries for the next several miles. Around and around, I replayed conversations, emotions, and strange dreams of the last seven days. My reason kept rebelling against what I was doing. You're driving right this minute back into the mountains wearing a suit. You're meeting someone who claims to be visiting you from another realm. Your whole life might change. You're going along with this scheme? I finally switched on the radio and let it cycle through the crackling channels. Only one country music station came through clear. Not my usual choice, but the words of the song it played captured my attention. I went sky diving. I went rocky mountain climbing. I went 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu. And I loved deeper, and I spoke sweeter. And I gave forgiveness I'd been denying. I turned up the volume. And he said, Some day I hope you get the chance to live like you were dying. Like tomorrow was a gift, and you got eternity to think about what you do with it. And what did you do with it? The music disappeared into a haze of static as the road curved between high canyon walls. I thumbed this button on my steering wheel to turn the radio off. Live like you were dying. I always preferred to live courageously and not think much about death. Death would come some day, and I would deal with it. I was more concerned with chalking up a high score. My grand plan was to make a pile of money, and then armed with wealth and leisure, to devote myself to building a generous legacy. Whatever I was up to at present pointed in a different direction. Grimes Creek runs directly into Highway 21 and rushes around a sharp bend as it joins Moores Creek to form a larger stream that empties into Lucky Peak Reservoir. Most of the roads in this rocky region follow these creeks. It's an acknowledgment of Mother Nature's superior wisdom in taking the path of least resistance. In my imaginative state that day, the highway's twists and turns made me feel like I was riding the back of a giant snake that would carry me far back into the mountains according to its own whim. The clouds closed in, and a fine, misty rain fell as I approached the left turn for Grimes Creek Road. The thermometer read 39 degrees. It was getting cold. Overnight snow was likely. 4.57. I braked and waited for a car coming fast in the opposite lane. Its headlights glared on the wet pavement, and it threw a spray of water against my windshield. I was already coasting forward to make the turn, and as soon as the lane cleared, I pressed the gas. My tires spun on the slick road, and I never saw the vehicle that materialized around the bend. It was driving without headlights in the gloom, and when the impact came... I was astonished. Crash! I was flung hard against the seatbelt. My hands flew off the steering wheel, and I opened my mouth to scream. Side curtain airbags exploded in the rear window. My entire car was lifted and whipped around in a circle as if some gi clumsy giant child was spinning me like a top. Sounds, lights, and grinding metal blended in a shocking collage that burst across the sky in my mind and hung there, suspended in stillness for a long moment. A few dazed seconds later, I squinted and looked around. I'm okay. No blood. Nothing hurts much. I blinked and turned to look for the other car. Aside from the adrenaline still sparking through my system and muscles stiff with terror, I seemed to be injury-free. Through my windshield, I could see that my car was facing the wrong way. The highway was quiet. I glanced in the rear view. No sign of the other vehicle. 
I became aware of a cramp in my leg. The car was still in gear, but my foot clamped on the brake. I shifted into park, then thought better of it, and eased off the brake and feathered the gas. The car moved, but a grating sound from the rear quarter panel told me that all was not well. Still in shock, I navigated a slow three-point turn and pulled off the highway on the sandy turnout at Grimes Creek Road. I unbuckled and opened the door. 4.58. That all happened in less than a minute, I thought. Chilly, moist air and the sound of rushing water from the stream rallied me and I climbed out of the car. Leaning against the door frame, I was dazed. Fear drained away, leaving me shaky. I shook my head and looked around. The dusk was quiet except for the water sounds and rain patter. I shuffled back to the side of the highway and looked both ways. I could see red taillight shatters scattered on this road, but there was no sign of another vehicle anywhere. Concentrating for a moment, I realized I had zero impression of the other car. Nothing. As if a ghostly freight train had exploded out of the night, smashed my vehicle, and disappeared without a trace. Probably can't use that explanation with the insurance company, I thought. Really, though, it was a hit and run. The other guy never slowed down at all. I walked back to my car and knelt down to inspect the damage. The fender behind the rear passenger tire was crushed. The trunk had sprung open and the bumper was almost touching the ground. I touched the crumpled sheet metal with my fingertips and flakes of paint stuck to them. Strange, I couldn't find any color from the other car. Curiouser and curiouser. Numb fog hovered inside my brain. I took a few steps toward the creek and leaned against a pine tree. The breeze carried the smell of wet willow shoots and sagebrush glowing, growing on the alluvial flats across the water. I breathed deep. This cleared my head and triggered the t ticking of my internal clock. What time is it now? I glanced down at the glowing dial of my stainless steel Rolex Submariner. 5.04. Still plenty of time. If I could figure out a way to make the car drivable. There was probably a bungee cord or some kind of strap in the car. Hell, I'd use my necktie if it came right down to it. These practical thoughts steadied me. I closed my eyes and took a few more slow breaths. In the same instant, a hand touched my shoulder and a man's voice said, It's time to go now. Electric surprise and fear jolted me. I whirled. Lucius stood within arm's length, regarding me with steady eyes. Drops of rain hung from his leather hat brim, but his clothes weren't wet. What, your... How did you get here, I said, my voice loud and harsh. He raised his eyebrows. Why should his arrival occasion this reaction? The accustomed rules of travel through space and time seemed to be optional for him. He looked so thoroughly human that it was hard to remember that he was a trans-dimensional visitor. I was coming, I said. I'm not late yet. Yes, he replied. We need to go. Now. They're waiting for us. How will we go? Uh, wait, where are we going? I thought we were using my cabin. No, he said. We have a journey to make. Leave your car here. I have a truck. He pointed behind him. Sure enough. Beside my car was a large black Nissan Titan that looked brand new. It was idling and the headlight shone through the falling rain. I never heard it approach. The river gravel didn't crunch under his feet as he walked to where I stood. It was all very odd. I can't just leave my car, I said. That would cause all sorts of panic. Someone will find it sitting here and connect the dots. They'll call the police to report the accident, and that will create drama, especially if I'm not around to explain what happened. That's not important, he said. But we can leave it at your cabin, if you like, to get it out of the way for a while. He walked over and pulled up hard on the dragging bumper. As on most modern cars, this one was plastic covered with more than a real bumper. He hit it with his fist, twice. It popped back into place and stayed. Come on, he said, this will work for now, let's get going. By the time I returned to the car and buckled in, he was already driving away. I followed his taillights and soon we left the pavement to climb the muddy roads toward my property. He drove fast, sure of his directions. The wet forest closed in on both sides like a dark tunnel. When we reached my driveway, Lucius pulled over so I could...